This lecture will do a shallow dive into the emergent management of an acute upper GI bleed in the A and E setting. An upper gastrointestinal bleed or GI bleed is defined as the intraluminal bleeding from an intestinal source originating proximal to the ligament of trites where the duodenum meets the jejunum. Mortality rates from upper GI bleeds are 10% much higher than that of a lower GI bleed. Bleeding from the upper GI is four times more common than bleeding from the lower GI also. At least one patient per day will be admitted in most hospitals with an upper GI bleed. This lecture will closely mirror the guidelines from the American College of Gastroenterology, the American College of Emergency Physicians, and the National Institute for health and care excellence. The treatment of an upper GI bleed varies based on what the expected cause is. Therefore, it is important to know what the medical team suspects as the cause. In patients without known cirrhosis, peptic ulcer disease is the most common cause of an upper GI bleed, followed by esophagitis. In cirrhotic patients, variceal bleeding is the most common cause of an upper GI bleed at 50%. Mortality rates vary between 3 and 14% in different studies depending on the cause of the bleed and the recurrence of bleeding may be as high as 15%. The risk factors for peptic ulcers are pretty well known and are listed here. Examples of physiologic stress include many items that can make the patient more susceptible to a GI bleed, especially when more than one occurs. The physical signs of a bleed would be similar to those of a hypotensive patient such as tachycardia, low blood pressure, dizziness, orthostatic hypotension, a slow capillary refill time, and shortness of breath. Also, patients often show signs of bleeding like hematemesis or vomiting blood, melena or dark tarry stool, coffee ground like emesis, or even hemochesia, which is bright red blood per rectum if the upper GI bleed is brisk and significant. The tests ordered for an acute upper GI bleed are pretty straightforward and obvious. In addition to these listed, some patients may require troponins or an EKG if they have a cardiac history or concerns that will be exacerbated by significant intravascular blood loss. There are also a couple scoring systems available to help assess the severity of the bleed to determine the level of care and the urgency of invasive treatments needed like an endoscopy. Medication-induced esophagitis is injury to the esophagus by a medication. Medications that most commonly cause leading to a bleed are the oral bisphosphonates, NSAIDs, tetracyclines, potassium, and iron. Risdronate is generally the best tolerated oral bisphosphonate. The size of the medication, the position of the patient, and amount of fluid ingested with the medication affect the rate of esophageal transit. Onset of symptoms after ingestion of the medication is highly variable. Primarily, the patient will complain of heartburn, painful swallowing, or difficulty swallowing. Patients who complain of difficulty swallowing pills are more likely to develop esophagitis. Treatment for esophagitis is to obviously discontinue the causative medication. If it cannot be stopped indefinitely, then a liquid formulation should be offered. Acid suppressants can be provided and other recommendations are upright posture for 30 minutes after taking the medication and to increase fluid consumption when taking medication. Securing the airway, as with any critical patient, is the first priority. 
When the patient is considered to have a possible GI bleed, they will be labeled as NPO immediately. IV fluids should be promptly started in the patient as a first measure to treat or prevent hypotension in the patient with an active bleed. Generally, 500 cc of normal saline over 30 minutes is given and then titrated based on vital signs. While not specifically addressed in the literature, it is reasonable to use IV antiemetics in these patients as needed. It has been reported that in 3 to 19 percent of upper GI bleeds, no obvious source of bleeding can be identified. This may, in part, be related to the presence of blood and clots impairing endoscopic visualization. The dose of prokinetic erythromycin most commonly used is 250 milligrams and is infused 30 to 120 minutes prior to upper GI endoscopy. A cost-effectiveness analysis found that pre-endoscopy erythromycin infusion in upper GI bleeds was cost-effective, primarily due to a reduction in the need for second-look endoscopies. For patients with severe acute blood loss, transfusion certainly should be considered. Most believe we should transfuse for a hemoglobin level of less than 7. However, the threshold for transfusion may be higher in those with cardiac concerns or history. If the patient has thrombocytopenia, platelets can be transfused, and if the patient has been on warfarin with an elevated INR, FFP or PCC can be transfused. Labs like platelets, hemoglobin, and INR should be routinely checked at least every six hours depending on the patient's clinical stability. IV proton pump inhibitors are recommended for all patients, regardless of the cause, as a 80 mg bolus followed by an 8 mg per hour continuous infusion. Less acid in the stomach allows clots to stabilize and therefore promotes hemostasis. Gastric acid inhibits platelet aggregation, it impairs clot formation, and promotes fibrinolysis. The goal is a pH of higher than 6, and histamine antagonists or H2 blockers are ineffective in sustaining a pH of 6 or greater and producing significant clinical outcomes. IV PPIs reduce rates of rebleeding and duration of hospital stay in patients with an ulcer. In a patient with severe liver impairment or cirrhosis, varices are very common and octreotide should be administered. Additionally, Patients with cirrhosis who are hospitalized with an upper GI bleed have a 50% chance of developing an infection, which is high enough to warrant antibiotic prophylaxis in these patients. Generally, ceftriaxone or ciprofloxacin are used, but again, selection should be based on your hospital's antibiogram. Endoscopies generally should be done within 24 hours, but will be variable based on the severity of the patient and availability of facilities. Endoscopies are both the ultimate and finalizing diagnostic tool and can also be therapeutic. Varices can be banded and ulcers can be cauterized. Epinephrine can be injected around the ulcer for vasoconstriction to reduce blood flow to the hemorrhaging site. Not all EGD procedures require sedation, but often physicians will use midazolam for some sedation in these patients. Pharyngeal anesthesia like lidocaine sprayed on the back of the throat to suppress the gag reflex may also be used. In summary, initial stabilization is most important while assessing history, physical exam, and lab values. 
Transfusion and medications are based on the individual patient scenario and although not always needed, particularly in mild cases, endoscopy is the ultimate diagnostic and treatment tool. These are the references. Thank you for your time and attention.